Welcome to Tanak Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Two Guys Exploring Christianity. Today we have a special guest going to be joining us, uh, Mr. Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. Uh, for now, let's get our old friend, old, old friend, like very, very old just old. kidding. <laughs> man, he's old. Greg, Greg, my man McBride, not the ride, is back <laughs> in the house as usual. So, <laughs> all right, all right. So, uh, yeah, old friend sort of rolled into like really, really old, especially after we realized really old how friend. much older you are There's than a John, Dr. Age McClatchy. You get to, and it doesn't matter after that. I see. You know, I'm right there. So. <laughs> right, right. Well, I realized that I was getting older than I, than I wanted to be whenever somebody asked me how old I was, and my response was, what year is this? So <laughs> you have to kind of do the math. So. <laughs> I try to just remember the decade ages, you know what I mean? And then nice. forget so, yeah. See, it should be easy for me because I was actually born on an on you know the ten. Oh, I, was, I was born in the seventy, wow. so you would think that would be really fast. Yeah. So, but yeah. So okay, good. So uh, just uh, yes. rolling back on the last few weeks have been really great. Good, good turnout. Good, uh, good chat messages. A lot of a lot of great questions. A lot of good points being brought up. So we really appreciate yes. that. Uh, and you yes. guys taking the time to engage. Uh, and like I said, if, if you feel like you're getting missed, your comments are getting missed, just simply shoot us an email. Uh, McBride. Shoot another email, yes. Yep, and his is, uh, I'll put it back on screen, GC McBride. 69, 63. Sorry, you're not, you're way older than I thought. Okay, yeah, 63. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at GC McBride, uh, 63 at gmail.com. And, right. um, and then if you have questions for me regarding any of the guests I have on my show, you can send that email to me, William at Tanak Talk. And you're right, I still didn't put it on there. William at Tanak Talk.com. Just spell it at the, uh, and there's no apostrophe on there. So just William at Tanak Talk.com. So anyway, right. so yeah, yeah, there's that. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, so with with that with that being said, um, yes. let's go ahead and introduce. First of all, uh, t t first of all, before we introduce the guest, tell me how did you how did you come into meeting this gentleman? I met this gentleman by a mutual rabbi friend of ours. He was one of the people that I contacted, uh, possibly to debate mm. uh, Rabbi Singer. I got you. Um, that did not happen. But I realized that Mr. McClatchy is a very smart man. I like smart. Right. And he's very, very highly intelligent. He is a uh, professor. Um, and I liked, I liked the, his willingness to engage. Um, and like I said, he engaged with several different uh, people that I also have watched online. Uh, so he is um, our first guest. He is a first guest, uh, from, meaning only guest, first, first only guest, guest for today, but first guest for oh, future shows. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to clarify for this segment. So, right. <clears throat> um, his name is Doctor Jonathan McClatchy. Doctor Jonathan McClatchy, welcome, welcome to the show. Glad you're able to make it with us today. Uh, and so you guys, his email and website, there's actually, he has multiple websites, but this will be the one best one to reach out to him on, um, talk about doubts.com. And of course, Jonathan at is how you reach that. Uh, so, uh, with that being said, before I, we get into our main topic for today, I would like doctor, <laughs> would you please go ahead and just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So my name is Jonathan and I'm an assistant professor at a Christian college called Sattler College in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I have an organization that I run and founded called TalkAboutDoubts.com, uh, where we basically mentor Christians who are struggling with doubts about faith, as well as ex-Christians who want to explore whether there's a rational road back to faith. And uh, so if anyone wants to reach out for a private one-on-one -on -one Zoom conversation with myself or other scholars, then talkaboutdoubts.com is a good place to go. You can also go to jonathanclatchy.com, where I um, archive a lot of my articles, essays, uh, on various subjects relating to intelligent design. I'm very, very fascinated. I have a PhD in biology and I'm very interested in evidence of design in nature, uh, the existence of God and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of material on that topic. I'm also interested in epistemology of miracles, I'm interested in New Testament scholarship as well, and I'm also interested in uh, the topic of messianic uh, prophecy and interacting with uh, Jewish uh, objections to Jesus as the uh, Hebrew Messiah. I've also uh, written a number of articles addressing uh, various things that Rabbi Tobias Singer has said in his books and videos as well. Very good. So you uh, you probably deal with uh, at least a handful of atheists, people going atheists and agnostics as well, apparently, with your topics that you cover. Does that sound about right? 
Yes, I interact with a lot of atheists. I've done uh, cool. various uh, debates with atheists and agnostics and uh, people of various worldview perspectives. I've also done debates with Muslims, like Dr. Shabir Ali, for example, several times. And um, um, so, yeah, I, um, I, I minister primarily to atheists uh, and non-believers, but I'm also interested in people of alternative theistic worldview perspectives, too. Like us. Yay, we have you here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess it's a good uh, good introduction and time for us to get the show on the road. And, uh, right. Doctor, I again appreciate your presence here and I look forward to what you've got to say. Greg? Okay, yes, thank you. So my question for you is, in, in the Christian scriptures, in the New Testament, what verses would you say would tell us that Jesus is... God? Absolutely. It's a great question. So there's there's a lot of New Testament texts that we could uh, address here, um, but um, to try and keep this within the space of five to seven minutes, let me just highlight a few key texts that I think point quite powerfully to the deity of Christ. So one classic is in John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, um, in, in Greek, this reads, uh, in arche in o logos, ke o logos, en pros ton dion, ke dios en o logos. And basically, in, in Greek grammar, uh, when you have um, uh, uh, and then without the definite article that would be theos or God uh, that precedes the verb or ain, which is ain in this case then it's taken as a qualitative so the best way of translating this I would argue is all that God was the word also was um, so that would be one text um, we continue reading also in John 1 we get to verse uh, verses 2 through 4 it says he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so, in other words, this uh, this word that was from all eternity past with God, as far back as you want to push that beginning, the word was already in existence. Uh, through this word, uh, this this personal word, all things were created uh, without exception. And so that would imply strongly the deity of Christ very consistently with the first verse that we read there in John 1. We continue reading it throughout the text. We get to verse 14, and it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, um, park that thought for a moment and then read verse 23, where John the Baptist gives his identity uh, to those who inquire as to who he is. And he says, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, what's interesting is that he's actually quoting from Isaiah 40, uh, verse 3, um, where we have um, a text concerning, um, concerning Yahweh, and it says, in verse 3, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground should become level and the rough places a plain. And verse 5, and the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so then that illuminates uh, the context of verse 14, where it says we have seen his glory. And, and he's thinking about Isaiah 40, verse 5, where all flesh will see the glory of Yahweh. And yet John says, we've all seen the glory of Jesus. Also in John 12, verses 37 through 40, it says, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe for, um, for again, Isaiah said, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest you lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. As I said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Now the first quotation there is from Isaiah 53 verse 1. The second quotation there is from Isaiah 6 verse 1. So Isaiah 6, um, I'm, I'm quoting from the Greek Septuagint here, which is the translation that uh, that John is alluding to, uh, quoting from the English translation of the Greek Septuagint. It says, and this happened in the year when King is when Uzziah the king died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and raised throne, and the building was full of his glory. So whose glory did Isaiah see in Isaiah 6? According to Isaiah, it was the glory of Yahweh um, on his throne, or Adonai. Um, but according to, according to John, it was Jesus' glory. And so that, again, points to the deity of Christ. And let's go to the, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. 
um, it, Paul writes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now notice this phrase, who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that recall from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, from the Tanakh? Joel chapter two, verse 32. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And yet Paul says, everyone will, uh, the, all those who are believers call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, likewise, in Romans 10, verse nine and 13, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, quoting from Joel 2. Um, Revelation 1, uh, 7 and 8 is another example uh, um, of the deity of Christ. It says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so Amen, which is, of course, a, a quotation from Zechariah 12, verse 10, where it says, I will pour out in the house of David and inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And yet, um, according to Revelation, that is uh, to do with Christ. And so Christ is, in fact, God. Continue reading the same chapter, verse 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Uh, this relates to, um, again, the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Or Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I called, I am he, I am the first and I am the last. It seems pretty unequivocal that it's trying to convey to us the deity of Christ. Let's go to one more example. This is from Titus chapter 2, verse 13, where Titus, uh, where Paul says to Titus, waiting for our ble um, blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is what uh, Greek scholars call a Granville Sharp construction. And a Granville Sharp construction is when you have the copulative chi, chi is a conjunction, what we translate normally as and, and a copulative conjunction are, um, is a word that joins other words and indicates the relation of additional information. And so when the copulative chi connects two nouns of the same case, um, if the article ho or any of its cases precedes the first of the said nouns or, or participles, and it's not repeated before the second noun or participle, the latter always relates to to the same person that is expressed or described by the first noun or participle. And so um, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ is describing not two individuals, but one individual. And so again, um, uh, I contend that uh, Jesus is being uh, uh, um, stated to be uh, God himself incarnate in the New Testament. So I rest my guess. Very cool. Very right. cool. All right, Mr. Mr. Doctor. Dr. Jonathan Dr. McClatchy, <laughs> it has been a pleasure having you on the air. I, I really appreciate your input and your scholarship, and uh, we'll, we will definitely uh, look forward to having you on air once again. And so uh, please tell whoever allowed you if you're married. You're, are you married? Yes, yeah. I am. Okay, yes, yeah, tell her thank yeah. you for lending you to us for this time, <laughs> and uh, prepare well, her to lend you to us more in the future. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You bet, you bet. You yeah. guys, all right, thank you, sir, and you have a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all right, all right. All right, well, that was definitely a lot of fun, and uh, yep. we're looking forward to uh, to your response. So, uh, right. But before we get too far along, just so we make sure we have enough time for the program, uh, you've brought in a couple verses that we're going to contrast together. Yes. Yep. Um, and we'll put those up, discuss it. But I think before uh, uh, before we get too far, uh, just you you were going to address a few things, but then you're going to come back and actually answer his 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 actual statement. Correct. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. We'll address we'll address um, several of the points that he made. Okay. Um, I I will clearly uh, note the scripture references that okay. I will use. Those will be very very well laid out for you to read for yourself. So very uh, we thank him again. Yes, I'm certainly. Very happy. Oh, and next week, um, Rob Solberg yep. uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, he has written several books. I have one of his books, and I have read it, actually. Um, it's called Torahism, and he will be addressing the question of where does the Hebrew Bible tell us that the Messiah will die 
be dead for three days and rise from the dead. Good. And good. Yeah, we good. are clearly told that we are told that at least three places in the Christian Bible in First Corinthians 15, mm-hmm. in uh, Luke 24, and in John 20. Right. So and I can only, those and I can only think clear. what I, I what I used to think was I would always refer back to uh, Jonah, Jonah, and then uh, yeah. and then then Isaiah, of course, and then kind of curious where right. else. Well, all right. Well, that was uh, that was definitely informative. And uh, again, yes. Doctor McClatchy, I appreciate you taking the time out. Um, so, what we'll do is to give uh, Mr. McBride time to format his answer in response to your uh, your presentation. Uh, we'll this will be kind of like a two part video, but y'all will be seeing it all as one. Okay. Well, very good. All right. So I'm gonna turn this on to you and let you uh, get on with your your verse comparison and whatever. Okay. Well, start off with whatever closing comments you want to have for Doctor um, uh, Jonathan McClatchy. I'd- there we go. Let me respond to your um, assertion that the Septuagint is an accurate portrayal of the Hebrew Scriptures. The Septuagint is only of the five books of Moses. This this is attested by uh, Philo. This is attested by Josephus. This is actually attested by the church father, Jerome. Uh, Jerome, in his introduction to the book of Chronicles, states clearly in the third century BC that the the Septuagint, the Greek translations that are available to him, there are three of them. There are the recension of Hesychius, there is the recension of Lucian, and the recension of Origen. These are all three church fathers. Church fathers are the ones who translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. The original Septuagint is done by 72 rabbis. It is done in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, circa 286 BCE, 286 or 268, I, I get them crossed up, but nearly three centuries before the Christian era. So that to say that they that those church fathers accurately translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek is a stretch at best. Um, the, The Hebrew scriptures, again, from the 147th Psalm are only given to the Hebrew people, to the Jewish nation. They alone knew how to read it because there were no vowel markings uh, in, in the original scrolls. So, so we will try to use Hebrew translations. And again, a translation is a commentary. Uh, all the viewers should understand that. If you go to Chabad.org, uh, you can read a translation from Hebrew into English. Um, it's not 100% accurate. It's not because no translation can be 100% accurate, but it's it's way closer than what the church did to the Hebrew Bible. And you can read Rashi's comments on Chabad. Um, it's free. It's a great tool. And uh, I would recommend that you use it before you use our current Septuagint. So. Um, I was looking for that real definite um, clear teaching that Jesus is God. Uh, a couple of the times you said it points towards. Um, that's kind of like the the theophanies uh, in the in the Hebrew Bible, uh, where the Christians, where Christian apologists always say, "Well, this is a theophany." Hey, I did, that's another big word for me there too. William, so mark that one down. It is. Uh, it is. Theophany. Theophany is just. It's defined as a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus, and Christian apologists point to those a lot of times in the Hebrew Bible, and it's it's kind of that same thing. It's it's not a direct thing. It's a it's a theophany, and I I didn't hear what I really wanted to hear. I, I did hear from from John chapter one. Um, uh, where it says the Word was God, or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's a very uh, very clear New Testament teaching. But 
how many, let, let me ask you this, and, and Mr. McClatchy, you're going to be free to respond to this. How many different things are there for Jesus now? We, we have, uh, we have a lot of things in the, in the Hebrew Bible. We have the word, we have the arm of the Lord, we have the spirit of the Lord, we have the angel of the Lord. Um, we have wisdom. We have all these things that Christians say, well, that's really talking about Jesus. So part of my, my follow-up or part of the dialogue I want to have is like how many of these things in other words, why aren't there like six or seven members of this Godhead? Because you couldn't have Jesus being the Word, the angel of the Lord, like famously in Matthew's uh, crucifixion narrative, I, I made a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek that in, in Matthew's narrative, the angel of the Lord rolls away the stone. So in Christian parlance, that would be Jesus rolled away his own stone. Um, and I, I don't mean that as, as, a, as a stab at anybody. I'm, I'm making an observation that this would have to be what was being taught there, that Jesus rolled away his own stone, because in Christianity, the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Even though that passage famously says that the angel of the Lord cannot forgive your sins. Uh, that I've never heard that addressed either, but I digress. So when we have in, in John chapter one, when we have this word that is also God, and then it says that Hashem created everything through this word, it doesn't say that it was Jesus. It says that it was the Word. Now, I grant you that in the in the following verses, this Word will become flesh and will dwell among us. Um, I, I would point out, and I hope you address these things directly, because, again, I, I have a hard time getting Christian apologists to address them directly. Just as a sidebar on that, there are four places in the Hebrew Bible. We would be in Numbers chapter 27, in Job chapter 9, uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 15, and then famously in Hosea chapter 9. All four of these places, it literally says that Hashem is not a man. Um, I have pointed this out to many apologists and preachers. The answer I get is always pretty much the same. I'll, I'll be interested to hear your answer. But when, when the Hebrew Bible says that Hashem is not a man, I'm wondering how he becomes a man then. But past that, or, or I think more important than that, is that we are clearly told in the Hebrew Bible, uh, we'll go to, we'll just do two of them. We'll do chapter 45 and chapter 44 of Isaiah. And in 44, in verse 24, thus said Hashem, your Redeemer and the one who formed you from the womb, I am Hashem who made everything who spread out the heavens by myself and firmed the earth of my own accord. And then he says in 45, uh, verse 12, I made the earth and I created mankind upon it. It is I, my hands spread out the heavens and I commanded all of its host. Now, Interspersed along in there is that um, right in the very beginning of 45, um, verse 5, 
I am Hashem, and there is no other. Other than me, there is no God. And so, you know, there's it's hard. Oh, go ahead. There, yes, there's I actually have uh, I, I created a list about three years ago that I just had I just started compiling from just reading and the two of those two that you mentioned were definitely on that list and another one that really I mean, there's actually so many of them the list I've got is like 50 or 60 yeah. uh, references from the Hebrew scriptures that, that really shows that God was there was no Trinity there was no there wasn't even a Trinity uh, there was no Jesus right. is God so to speak uh, but these will kind of this this is definitely pointing to it as well so this is 4310 did you, you did you call 4310 yet? Isaiah 4310? I didn't call 4310, no. It says, You're no. my witness, saith the Lord, and my servant, who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Correct. Right. Yes. And so and then so you have... that's so so for, for Mr. McClatchy, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. See, I, I, I don't have any ambiguity here. There's this is my creator, and he states I am Hashem. I am the creator. Right. I'm alone. There is no one besides me. So what I'm looking for is where does Jesus himself say, I am the creator. I created everything. And then explain to me how, or, or he would explain how he now exists apart from the Father. And, and I, I think that a, a student of the New Testament realizes, you know, that this was a big contentious problem in the early church because we don't have those clear statements. This is how we get um, modalism, for example, uh, which was considered heresy, I believe, but in other words, modalism basically states that there's one God, but he appeared in different modes, uh, in, a, in a heavenly mode, in, a, in an earthly mode. And that's a, that's a Catholic te teaching as well. It, it would not be accepted in the church today, but that was a very prevalent teaching. So Right. Okay, uh, so also um, now Isaiah 42.8 this would, I think this would certainly be, like you had mentioned, uh, like a, a verse similar to what we were looking for from Dr. McClatchy, something crystal clear, very, very plain, black and white, everybody understands it. And this yeah. is something that would apply in, in reverse to Dr. McClatchy. Um, as Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. He even says, that's my name. My name is not Jesus. That's my name. And actually, it's the, my the, name's not Jesus. I it, am Hashem. It uses, I believe yeah. in Hebrew, it uses yeah. the tetragrammaton, which is the Yud it and the It does a. use a tetragrammaton, yes. And it says, yeah. that is my name. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, I have many names. That would have been a great spot for that. And it says, and it goes on to say, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And ironically, right. we know that the, the, the form of Jesus or Yeshua has been, that's the one thing that people cherish it are the graven images. They have the crosses on their necks and their, they, you know, the, right. the images in the churches and things like that. I mean, um, but the point is, he, he, my glory, I will not give to another at all. So, right. Um, yeah. And, and, um, one, one other thing too, don't ever forget that in, in the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, it would be like probably maybe halfway through the chapter, um, Hashem tells Moses, remember, at Mount Sinai, you only heard a voice. Yes. You, you saw no form. I did not show you a form. And I believe that, that Jonathan, you used um, image in one place. And I, I forget that. I, I listened, right. uh, but I, I forget where it was. But, but our Creator never showed an image to the children of Israel. And... The reason, ironically, is because he knew they would make idols and worship it. Can just I read like that they little did the... block? Sure, of, yeah, of go text. ahead. Yeah. So Deuteronomy chapter got... 4, uh, verse, starting at verse 12, might be uh, yes, a good spot. Yes, that's roughly in the center of the chapter. <laughs> okay, so, and the Lord spoke to Moses, uh, spoke, excuse me, spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but you saw no similitude. You only heard a voice. And he declared uh, unto you his covenant. Okay, and it goes on in verse 15. Skip 14, yeah. go to 15. It says, Take heed, therefore, 
In other words, be very, very careful. Very careful. For you yeah. saw no manner of similitude on the day the Lord spoke to you in Horeb out of the midst of fire, lest you, here's, here's the big banger, lest you corrupt yourselves. How can right. a person corrupt yeah. himself? And he's fixing to tell you how. And you make a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of a male or female. Right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, Mr. McClatchy, these are, these are things that I want to have addressed. I mean, I want to know how this changed or when this when it became okay uh for 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 hashem for the creator to assume the form of a man and then for that man to be worshiped um and and i'm saying worshiped because again i I think i talked in a previous show that there are uh branches of Christianity that do not worship Jesus. They think he was a great prophet and such and such like that. But again, I'm, I'm speaking to the vast majority of the Christian world because Jesus gets worshiped in churches every Sunday morning. So, so I'm hoping that we, we address the, the, the Hebrew scripture that says that there is no one that helped Hashem create but then the book of John says that, well, yes, this this entity called the Word right. helped. It didn't only help him create, but Hashem created everything through this entity that will become flesh and will become known as Jesus. So that that's right. that's something that I would like to have addressed. I also have a question that that I've been meaning to ask I've I've alluded to it a couple times why does since, since our creator clearly states and again this is this is Psalm 147 the the final three verses only the children of Israel received the words of God no other nation so why then did our creator pivot and choose Greeks to to convey his word to us. He did not tell his prophets that he was going to do that, or I am unaware of where he told his prophets that he was going to change uh, nations, and he was going to go with Greek-speaking peoples instead of with the Hebrew nation. So that's a that's a good that's a good conversation to have i think because i i've never heard that addressed in any of the uh, even when rabbis debate preachers i've never heard that addressed so and and amos so. definitely clarifies or confirms that as well correct amos, yes amos 3 Very. 7 uh, says surely the lord god will do nothing unless he reveals it his yes. secret and to his yeah. servants the prophets yeah. And so everything that you and I have been quoting from are from the prophets. Um, and Correct. they are very clear on what it means. Yes. Whenever I see, uh, and a lot of the things that were mentioned, uh, that you mentioned earlier, Dr. McClatchy, they, they seem to be kind of like, like you said, with hints, but that's really not what we're looking for here. Uh, and, and besides right. the hints that you're revealing, they actually contradict the crystal clear messages that we have been given by the prophets. So, by the prophets, yes, mm-hmm. yes. So we, so we as humans, we have to try to, we have to try to mesh this together. In right. other words, we can't, and and I would hope that Christians would mesh that together too, sure, sure. Because you know, their the claim of Christianity is that it is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible, and so the, the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible can't be can't contradict the Hebrew Bible. I mean, that, that's just, that's very logical. It's, it's excellent that you pointed out because there are, there are ambiguities in the Hebrew text. There are things that are not completely crystal clear. There are things that appear to be a, a little bit contradictory. Um, they, and we can do a whole show on, well, we could do several shows on those. Um, one thing rabbis never do is run away from those texts they always address them head on and show how they how they 
go together and how they mesh. So I'm hoping that you will show me how John 1 and the very beginnings of that chapter will mesh with what Isaiah says our creator said. So that's that's a that's a very important thing for me. I I, I need that. I want that. I desire right. that. So right. One uh, oh, one other one other problem and again uh, I hope that the idea of how we only have 3 is is addressed because we've got a lot of we've got a lot of different things in in the he if in other words if if the spirit of the lord is a god too then i'm not sure why the why wisdom is not god also because wisdom it was there according to the 8th chapter of proverbs wisdom was there also uh so this is in, right. this is important to me to figure out how many how many members are there in this godhead that are all co-equal so and how how did you determine that there are three when we have we have lots of candidates uh in the, in the hebrew bible for also being god so you know um <sighs> as maybe one of my final thoughts on this whole thing which doesn't really it's not pointing whether jesus is part of a trinity or if he was god or not but it but it does um, contradict what Jesus or what what the New Testament um, church believers teach about the New Testament about God, and um, so in Deuteronomy four also in verse five through eight uh, it says, "Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments." Now, statutes and judgments are the different types of laws that God gave to the people out of the six hundred thirteen that's that's counted in the in the first five books. Uh, they're, they're combined with statutes, judgments, and uh, I'm going to blank on third. So ordinances. Or, ordinances. ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it says, "Behold, yeah. I have taught you statutes, statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do in the land where you should go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your this is your wisdom." Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for yeah. a second. Um, so he goes to say this this is the wisdom that that you would have so if god created these rules and laws for people to follow and then somebody came up and said you don't have to do them anymore and that that's that's a big problem to begin with so okay it says for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which all shall hear these of these statutes and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people right. meaning that without these statutes and judgments and laws we're not wise in understanding, right? right? And then Israel verse, is an also ran, <laughs> right? So verse yeah. seven uh, says, "For and for what nation is so great who hath God so near to them as the Lord our God is, and all these that we can call upon Him for? And what nation is so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all in this law which I set before you today?" So for Christianity right. to get rid of the law, they're getting rid of the wisdom, they're getting rid of the understanding of what God created to make this world a great place. Right. So Either that or we need to see where God changed his wisdom. Right. And in other words, we need, we need to see that. We need to see that from the prophets because if the prophets don't tell us, then we're not allowed to accept it. One of the one of the verses that you read, Mr. McClatchy, was um, where uh, would that have been in? Uh, that was, I believe, that was John chapter twelve. Um, you said that even after the great miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus had done, they they still didn't believe, and that this was a this was a portent of a prophecy that was being fulfilled in their midst. But the prophets are very clear that. The testing will be from from again from Deuteronomy 13. The testing will be that I'm going to send you prophets. I'm going to send you false prophets that will do signs, That's wonders, true, yeah. miracles. And but if they teach you, if they teach you to worship a god that your fathers did not worship, and fathers clearly are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Right. If they teach you to do that, then don't. Don't follow that prophet, and you are commanded in the thirteenth chapter to kill that prophet. And it's interesting because I I read a lot of books, and there is a there is a teaching that Jesus was crucified because he was 
teaching people to worship someone other than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I do not believe that, but it's an interesting avenue to explore. I don't believe that Jesus ever taught anyone to worship him. I agree. Uh, that's, yeah. that's me. Agreed. That's me. I completely but, agree. Hey, yeah. that's like at the beginning of the show, that thing of the hands. That's <laughs> where the hands came from. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but it's, <laughs> but it's clear, you know what I mean? There, there are a lot of people. Uh, I believe that the New Testament, that people teach people to worship Jesus. But I, I yeah, that's a to total sidebar, but I don't think that Jesus ever wanted to be worshipped as Hashem is worshipped. He is, he is not, uh, he, I, I don't know. I, again, I could be wrong on that, but because people smarter than me have debated that, but I'm, I'm not sure that 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 Jesus wanted people to worship him. So, yeah. um, oh, in that in that text, it was fulfilled. You you had a fulfillment citation from Isaiah, and it was it was Isaiah forty verses verse three. Um, I'm going to read that in context and re remember, viewers and everybody, myself included, context is the key. Um, so. In Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 1, we read, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak consolingly of Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her period of exile has been completed, that her iniquity has been forgiven. She has received double for all her sins from the hand of Hashem. A voice calls out in the wilderness, Clear the way of Hashem, make a straight path in the desert, a road for our God. Every valley will be raised, every mountain and hill will be lowered, the crooked will become straight, and heights will become valley. The glory of Hashem will be revealed, and all flesh together will see that the mouth of Hashem has spoken. Now, I and again, this is this is another question that that I hope you'll respond to. When Jesus walked the face of the earth, when did when did when were the when a clear teaching of the Tanakh is that at, at the end of days there's a reordering of the geography in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem, um, where the temple sets will be elevated above the other mountains that are around it. This is, this, is, this is the graphic, clear teaching. We don't have to wonder about this. It, it is reiterated here, not, not completely like it is in other places, but this is what's in view. The, the, the time of the context is after Israel's exile, and we are further told that Israel will become a wasteland and I still remember um, before World War II, after World War I, before World War II, Palestine was virtually, it was a wasteland. It really was. Nobody lived there. Nothing grew there. And then um, when Israel became a nation again in 1948, it, everything started to blossom again. So, and it's not... It's not just a few people that hear this. The, the Isaiah is clear. All flesh together will see that the mouth of Hashem has spoken. And this is one of the absolute rock-solid teachings in the Hebrew Bible of what transpires in the Messianic age, and that is that everybody knows. Everybody knows Hashem. So for... For, for Isaiah 40, verse 3, to have been fulfilled in Jesus' day, how, how could that be? Because there, are, there were tons of people that followed Baal. There were tons of people that followed uh, all kinds of gods. Oh my gosh, Caesar was God to probably half the Roman Empire. So obviously, all flesh together was not hearing the mouth of the spoken word of Hashem. So so that's you know that's a that's a point that I'd like you to address. And, go ahead. And to echo that whole point in verse five it says the glory 
the English says the glory of the Lord. But that word Lord too is also the Yud and the Hey and the Vav and the Hey, which is the specific Correct. name that was called out in Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. Right. That I am I am Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey. That is my name, and, and my glory right. I will not give to another. So there's no way he would be giving that glory or honor to another mm. even there, even if you were to say that uh, in that spot, uh, that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. You could say, well, he's going to, yeah, he's going to reveal it through Jesus, but he's not. He just said he will not share his glory with he anybody. Won't share that. And, yeah. and very we clear, have... his name is Yud and the Hey and the Vav and the Hey, not Yeshua, not Jesus. Right. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, in my, in my ending, uh, when I was, when I was exiting Christianity, by the way, the, the Tetragrammaton, the Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, that is mentioned roughly 7,000 times in the Hebrew canon. It's a very, very prolific. Um, so we know what the name of our creator is. Now, does he have different titles? Absolutely, he does have different titles. And there, there's no question about that. But the fact that he has different titles doesn't mean that he's different people. Uh, it's like, I live in Indiana, so my name is Greg, but I could also be known as a Hoosier. And, you know, I mean, Greg McBride, the Hoosier, or just the Hoosier. I, I mean, there, there right. are any number of things that we as, that we attach that is doesn't mean, in other words, there's not Greg McBride, and then there's Greg McBride, the Hoosier. Right. He's the same, he's the same person, even though it, the the identification marker changed but i'm still i'm still me i wish i wasn't let me tell you that because <laughs> it's pretty bad being me but <laughs> I doubt anyway, that anyway. i doubt that <laughs> that's a really great um, point though because it's like like for me i'm you know um i'm a dj i'm a Correct. talk show host yeah uh i'm a, i'm a carpenter you know i i'm yep. also a lawn technician i mean so even for me i right. have all these different titles uh but those titles are used for a reason specific timings but it never changes my right. my, my my right. version of the yud and the hay and the vav of and the hay which right. would be william never changes that stays yeah. the same yeah i my gosh i'm addressed by my grandchildren as grandpa perfect example i'm a, yeah. i'm addressed by my children as dad yeah. Uh, you know, so now they don't, my children, I, I, I credit them this, my children have never called me by my first name. Wow. And my grandchildren it, have never called me by my first name. That's a sign of um, respect and love. It is. And that's the and reason love. why we don't try to pronounce the tetragrammaton. Exactly. And, and that, that is, and I did not know that Hashem be merciful to me. Because I used to try, I thought I thought that I should, because there are places in the Hebrew Bible where it says "call on the name of Yud Hey Vav Hey," and so I took that to mean that I should only call on that name. And I, uh, this is why you need rabbis to teach you what Hashem intends for you. Perfect. And the idea that I don't call my Heavenly Father by his first name is the same reason that my children don't call me by my first name. I will never address my own father by his first name ever. But I'm even gonna, though but here's a great here's 80. a here's a great excuse and example as to when and how. Greg, please do be a, be kind. Tell me who is your dad? What is his name? Tell me your dad's name. Okay. Well, I I would you tell you could you tell me that because I don't Correct. know it because yeah, I don't yeah. know it and you have reason yeah. to share that I've, name now. Correct. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because hey, you're screwing up this job, Greg. We want the real carpenter to come in here. Where's your dad at? <laughs> but that's the whole point, at, though. So even at 80 years old, yeah. I don't think my dad will ever make a mistake in carpentry. I, I, he is so meticulous. It's ridiculous. That's great. Ooh. Me and him would get and angry. There, now you can call me poet, too. <laughs> uh, he, he, he's ridiculous, ridiculous. That's great. So, all right. Well, I have I have two more points to make real quick. Go and for again, it. Mr. McClatchy, I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, I really do. And we look forward I, I to your a, return as well to kind of, we do. you know, to kind we of do. bounce us back and we forth a few times. So. Yes. 
Um, we are told at least two, and when I tell you the number of times that something appears in the Hebrew Bible, always take that with a grain of salt. I know, like I know four places where it says that our creator is not a man. There could well be more. I, I just haven't found them yet. I know two places in the Hebrew Bible. One is at the, in the last chapter of Psalms, that would be the 150th Psalm. And the other is in the last chapter of Zechariah, that would be chapter 14 of Zechariah. And we are clearly told that our Creator's name is one. His name is one. He has one name. So a, a, a question I have is, what if we have these different persons of this Godhead, which ones of them get excluded? Uh, does is there like a? I, I'm unclear about this since since I know from the from the prophets that my Creator has one name, and again we we don't have to wonder about this. You can you can simply look to Zechariah chapter 14 and read the 150th Psalm. And you will learn that our Creator has one name. So um, I, I this is another. I, I can't. I can't think that if there is a God person, a Creator, as in John chapter one, I can't imagine that that person will just go nameless. Um, and if he is a separate person, then he would have to have a name. Um, so that's that's a good question also. I, I will finish up. I don't mean to be piling on. I really don't. Um, I was hoping that we would get... Um, to be fair, to be fair, and, oh. and to you, to be fair, Mr. McBride, uh, after listening to the presentation that uh, that Dr. McClatchy had made, uh, he did bring up a lot of references with a lot of points that this took. It takes longer to respond to things sometimes than it does to actually m to make a statement. So, uh, so basically, yeah. we got it. You know, what he presented for us was a uh, uh, you know eight to ten minute statement, so to speak, and it just takes right. longer to explain those pieces of it. So um, explain the pieces. Yeah, yes. it's just it's yes. just sort of how it yeah. works. So, so well, I, I did notice one thing, and and please feel free to correct this in the future, um, uh, Dr. McClatchy. Um, you didn't give me any place where Jesus himself spoke. Um, I don't know if that was intentional or if that was an, uh, if that was, if you had, I, I don't know, maybe just that's the way it happened. But always in the Hebrew Bible, it says, Thus says Hashem, right? Or Hashem says, "I am. I. This is me. I am speaking. I am this. I am that." So I was hoping for a place where Jesus Himself would make a clear statement that He is God, that He is the Creator of the heavens and earth. In other words, if if John, the 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 last gospel, if he says it, surely Jesus would have someplace stated it. Jesus did say some things, and, and again, you can, you can explain these to me. Uh, in all of the synoptic gospels, Jesus encounters the rich young ruler, and Jesus himself, the, the rich young ruler comes to him and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response in all three of the synoptics is, why do you call me good? For God alone is good. And, and he says alone, as, as, as Hashem does several times, in, many times in the Hebrew Bible, I am all alone, there is none beside me. So my question, if Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth, why would he say that only God is good? Uh, that's, that's a good question because that, this is not, this is not something that Paul said or, or something that 
one of the authors of the Gospels said, this is what the Gospels are recording that Jesus himself said. Also, very famously, in in the 14th chapter of John, um, that would be mid, probably midway to... See, I get away with not knowing the exact verses because I can just say midway, and then, you know, if it's past the first one and before the last one, it's midway. <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> but Jesus himself says specifically... The Father is greater than I. And and I'd like you to address that, because, mm-hmm. again, this is Jesus himself speaking. And so if he is, if he if he is, is equal and of the same substance as the Father, why would he say that the Father is greater than I? And, of course, if we use the book of Mark, which is the least Christological and the first gospel, we just get we get Jesus deferring to his father all the time, like, um, well, the father sent me. Um, how, how, how would the father send himself? In other words, I, I send people to jobs. I really do. I've got people that work for me, and I send them to jobs. I never send myself to a job. <laughs> I, I, I go to a job. You know what I mean? Uh, and and all of the people that we work for know that I'm the one who's in charge, you know, because I'm the one who writes all the checks. And so I send my people to different various jobs. Homeowners and trailer dealers will never confuse the idea that that my workers are the same status, so to speak, as right. me. They, they know that I'm the one who's in charge because I do the sending. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of these, uh, some of these verses, um, I, I would just like you to address. I, I mean, I, I can probably give you uh, 30 or 40, 50 of them probably where Jesus himself is clearly establishing himself as inferior to the father. And, and then, so it, once we get past those places where he is inferior to the Father, i.e., the Father is greater than I, <laughs> then hopefully we can move on to where we start to get those clear teachings where Jesus is the right. Father yeah. and is of the same substance as the Father. So, well, one right. thing one thing I've I've noticed is that we could literally make this a twelve hour show. Um, Correct. Just where we're going. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll William, leave. I can make anything into a 12 hour show. <laughs> Believe me. Goodness so, gracious. <laughs> yep. So uh, so there you go. So there's that. And then uh, so we will uh, we will see uh, what the response is coming up on, on yep. uh, either the next show or however we however we piece all this together. Anyway, however we fit it. Yeah. Yep. Next week is Rob Solberg. Yep. Rob Solberg for sure. Uh, and, and the uh, question that he's going to address for us is he is going to show us. In the Hebrew Bible, um, where the Messiah dies, is dead for three days, and then rises on the third day, and he's going to give us those he's going to give us those prophecies that were given to the prophets of Israel that are then restated in the Hebrew or in the Christian Bible. Very so. good, very good. Well, that was definitely a lot of fun, no doubt, no doubt. Okay, so moving on now into our uh, our parallel verses that we're going to that you're that you're bringing to the table today, uh, we'll get rolled into that now. So, all right. So, thank you very much, um, Doctor McClatchy, for your time, and uh, uh, Greg, take it away. So, all right, go ahead. Our our contrasting scriptures for this week are found in Zechariah chapter eleven verse 12 and 13, and in Matthew chapter 27, verse 9 and 10. And I'm reading both from the King James Version again. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed out for my price thirty pieces of silver, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. 
And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. That would, that would be the temple, Zechariah speaking. In the book of Matthew, chapter 27, this is fulfilled according to the author of Matthew. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. Now, if William puts those up on the screen, yeah, you it. can you can just or this is again this is very simple to do on your own. I'm hoping that uh, a viewer, at least one viewer, listens very well because there is one thing about what I just read that should absolutely shock you. And that shocking would be that the author of the book of Jer of Matthew says that this text is found in the book of Jeremiah. Um, it's found in the book of Zechariah. So that's, that's like number one point there. Uh, again, for, and in the church we are taught that the Holy Spirit did all this. The, I am positive that the spirit of Hashem knows the difference between Zechariah and Jeremiah. So that's number one. And there are, there are hermeneutic fixes, so-called, for this. Um, it, and you as the viewer will have to study those and see if they work for you. But let's just look at the text again. In Matthew, the children of Israel valued. Where is that found in the book of Zechariah? That, that is added by the author of Matthew. And who is the potter? It, well, the word doesn't appear in the Hebrew canon, but if you, if you do a cursory study, the potter in Zechariah is the treasurer <laughs> of the temple. That's, that's, what the, that's what the King James calls the potter, because the money, the 30 pieces of silver, is thrown into the house of the Lord, into the temple. In Matthew... What happens to the 30 pieces of silver? They, they buy a field. So how are these two verses even really related? Besides the 30 pieces of silver, which the author of Matthew did not understand what the 30 pieces of silver represent in the Hebrew Bible. The, in the Hebrew Bible, these 30 pieces of silver are 30 righteous men. That, that's what they are. This is, the, this is the offering, so to speak, that gets cast into the, into the temple. Because Hashem is looking for righteousness in Zechariah, and he's asking for it to come, and there are only 30 righteous men found. And that is a... That is a... I'm, I, I promise you, you have to look this up. Um, Abraham, according to the Oral Torah, Abraham is promised that there will always be 45 righteous men in Israel. And during the Babylonian captivity, I believe there were 30 in Babylon. Daniel and his companions would have been among those 30, and there were 15 that still remained in, in the land of Israel. I'm I'm remembering this completely, and it's been a long time since I studied that. But I I'm positive I'm nearly positive that I'm correct. But this has nothing to do with actual monetary silver. This is to do with the thirty righteous souls in Zechariah. The author of Matthew, a highly learned Greek, 
can't can't catch the nuance, can't catch the meaning, because the meaning of Zechariah is confined to the nation of Israel, to the to the children of Israel. That's that's who it was given to. That's who understands it. So he takes not only does he change what it says and insert that the children of Israel were the ones that set the price. And we'll see today that Matthew, this is a theme of Matthew, that, that the Jews are bad, the Jews are bad, the Jews are bad. So, but just take these two verses, compare them, contrast them, and tell us that uh, Matthew correctly quoted the book of, not Jeremiah, he, he didn't get the book right. It's in the book of Zechariah. So again, you have to, at some point, you have to just realize that the authors of the New Testament really don't understand the Hebrew Bible. They're not capable of correctly quoting it. I would like to think that I can at least correctly quote it, especially if I've got it in front of me. So, all right. Yep. And we ha oh go ahead. No, you're good. I was just going oh, okay. to uh, fill in the All right, we there is a there is a commenter and your emails I I promise you that I am making a list of your emails uh, for cuz we've got a lot of shows to do with emails that I have received with really good questions, excellent questions. And thank you very much for those. Uh I really appreciate that there is a commenter that just continues, and 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 I, I don't know who you are. I, I bear you no ill will. <laughs> I hope you don't bear me any. Um, but you continue to say, like on our last show, when we when we demonstrated who the prophet likened to Moses was, you continue to say in your comment, oh. The prophet like unto Moses is Jesus. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so I, I would hope that in and, and you you say it multiple times. You, you're a you're a very prolific commenter. I would hope that instead of simply um, saying that, that you would provide me and please do this. You would provide me with the scripture that supports that Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. That that is my that's my goal. I anybody can just say something. Um, what I'm hoping for is that you will not just say that that. William and I concluded that Jesus is the prophet likened to Moses, because if you, oh, and by the way, thank you for the commenters who say, hey, just watch the show <laughs> before you, before you say Jesus is the prophet right, likened right. to Moses, just watch the show. Yeah. Um, so th thank you for those too. But for the, for the person who is, who is saying that Jesus is the prophet likened to Moses, please and you have my email address, and I promise that I will respond immediately to your email when you give me the scriptures that support your contention that Jesus is that prophet. So, my experience with the, and of course this is going on, uh, I think I'm in my ninth year now with the show, and the experiences that I have had with uh, people commenting in chat, Whenever they do kind of repeat themselves, um, pardon the expression, but spamming the whole statement over and over and over again, um, a lot of them don't watch the show. They see something and it startles them, and their only response is to block, is to block. And instead okay, of instead yeah. of seeing what it is that, that's coming towards them, they just they have the reflex of because the, they don't want to hear it, you know. It's it's right. it's startling to them. So and then I have found yeah. that a lot of people doing the same with the same approach uh, when questioned are actually like really young. They're like like some of them are seventeen, nineteen, twenty one years old who you oh, know. Yeah. And so okay. they they don't really know how to approach dealing with with people 
I see people like us because you and I both were Christians sometimes. And so right. they don't really know how to handle it. So they just go with their gut reaction. And that that's the way that they can maintain peace in their own mind. Get your breath, take a deep breath, breathe in, breathe out, and just say this. And it's kind of like uh, the the modus, uh, the mode, uh, what do you call it, mode operandi? <laughs> oh, <laughs> there, modus operandi. There you go, modus operandi. So, <laughs> and I know, because I was there. I used to do the same thing. So, uh, right, yeah. 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 But yeah, like you said, yeah. hopefully they will listen to the program. They will they will yeah. actually read your emails, and yeah. and you know respond to them intellectually. So it'd be really nice. Yeah, so. yeah, that's always We're that's gonna... always the. Oh, I I promise you, uh, viewers of this show, I will I will respond to uh, Mr. McClatchy's um, uh, comments and his his perspective. I will respond in a very uh, scriptural way. Um, it won't just be, oh, he's wrong. Uh, no, yeah. I would never do that because right. that's, that's, that's kind of what like cults do. Right. Um, if you're, if you're in a cult, you can never question. And if you do question, the question is always just sit down and shut up. Yeah. You know, right. you know what I mean? so, yep. but so. Well, what an exciting show. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad you, Mr. McBride, were able to piece this together as far as getting getting the guest on the show. Uh, I don't think I would have yep. ever thought to do that, and I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> to the next show also. And uh, right. as well as uh, Dr. McClatchy's, you know, response to this show as well. So it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. So, um, yep. again, thank you for your time, my man. And uh, if you guys would like to reach out to Greg McBride, his uh, – actually, I, I didn't mean to do that one. But his uh, gcmcbride63 at gmail.com. Yeah. And you get one yep. guess as to how old he is. And uh, <laughs> you look good for your age. I'll tell you that. I'll tell no, you that. Oh, do I? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so any, any questions you have for uh, for show topics specifically, uh, you can just send those to Greg or comments on the show. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me regarding guests for the show, uh, ones we already have or ones you would like to see, uh, contact me at William at, forget the apostrophe, W-I-L-L-I-A-M at Tanakhtalk.com. Just like you see it on the screen there. And uh and I will once again try to get that on there before the next show. <laughs> it's the third time. All right. Third time's a charm. I know. It's a charm. It is a charm. All, all right. Thank you all for tuning in, okay. and we'll see you on the other side. Peace, my friends, and y'all have a great, great day. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K. Com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shoot, Nicole, shoot, and let's be together.